Um, I'm very pleased to have speaking today. Amy Singer is joining us. Um, Amy is one of those quiet technical wizards and um, uh, has been you know, really a, a strong player in social media um, for many years. You're one of the early people on Twitter um, and blogging and all sorts of stuff um, and was one of the project managers for Intellipedia, is that correct? Um, I was one of the lead trainers. Lead trainers, excuse me. And um, so I invited Amy to come talk to us today um, pretty much about, you know, just yeah. views on, on how things um, are changing in our lives with multiple screens. Um, and, you know, if when I say multiple screens, obviously I'm talking about co TV, computer, mobile phones, tablets, you know, however many screens you happen to have around you in any given day. Um, and also, uh, just briefly while Amy's getting set up, um, I'd like to briefly thank Call Fire and NIC USA and Davenport Institute and Tech Zulu uh, for really just tremendous um, help in sponsoring Gov 20LA and helping us get going every year. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. And also, I just want to acknowledge the people that are in the room and tweeting and blogging and everything else, and greatly appreciate it. Uh, definitely getting a lot of interest online. And uh, you know, I want to say also to use the online tools. So Twitter. The hashtag is gov20la, gov20la. Feel free to use it to ask questions. If you'd like to have one of the speakers answer your question, that's a good way for us to do it. Uh, or you can send an email or a direct message. Um, and we'll have a few more speakers, and then we're going to break for lunch, and then we'll come back and have uh, an afternoon full of this again. Um, and I also just briefly want to say thank you to everyone who's been <coughs> supporting me and government 2.0 and Gov20LA for the last several years. Uh, it's really been an amazing experience. Uh, I can say that when I first jumped into this whole open government, Gov2.0 stuff, um, I never thought it was going to take me to places like Russia or Canada uh, or Australia or wherever because of that. But in fact, it has. And it's really opened my eyes to some of the things that are going on around the world in ways that I think um, you know we all have to start paying attention to. And, and I one of the one of the lessons that I've really been learning from the last several years of Gov 2.0 LA and, 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 and putting this together is the tremendous passion that people like yourselves have, people who are here in this room, the people who are watching online, um, the passion that you bring to your jobs, the passion that you bring toward to using technology to change our society, hopefully for the better. Um, it's something that I think you know many industries should learn from, this type of passion and the energy that that whether you work for a government agency or you work for a private company or a nonprofit or an academic institution and you're trying to help, you know, I think that this is where you, know, you can really see a big difference between the people who are putting their passion into something like social media or trying to use these stories, because it's storytelling, really. It's just like sitting around a campfire and telling a story. Um, but we're telling stories about technology or about world events. So whenever you're ready. I, um, but I think that, you know, it's really about passion and the people behind the technology. And I think that the storytelling that goes into it is something that every industry really needs to learn from. So with that, Amy Singer, and thank you very much, Amy. Hi, I just want to thank Alan for putting me behind the NASA people and, you know, following that act. Um, I can only go from, you know, the bottom up. Um, again, I'm Amy Singer, my, uh, I'm Twitter, Sang Sang and Twitter. And, um, I want to thank Alan for asking me to participate. Um, I'm actually kind of a retired Gov2O um, individual. I moved here from Washington, D.C. about two years ago, um, or a year and a half ago, um, to pursue screenwriting. So I'm currently an undiscovered, but soon to be discovered screenwriter. Um, but my previous career was working in various arenas in government um, in information technology, um, from everything from writing code for the State Department, um, which was very sexy, to uh, modernizing the state of Nevada's Department of Taxation, to most recently, as Alan mentioned, um, working within the intelligence community to kind of usher them into the age of Web 2.0, Enterprise 2.0, and social media with projects like Intellipedia, which is the Wikipedia for the intelligence community, to the CIA Wire, which is the pre uh, preeminent uh, kind of analytical dissemination device for the intelligence community. Um, now, when Alan asked me to speak, I was a little reluctant or hesitant, mainly because I've been 
retired from that, that gov government arena. Um, and he said, well, you know, I'm giving you a blank slate to talk about whatever you find interesting and relevant. And I kind of thought about it. And there is something that I found really compelling and interesting lately, and that's the use of the second screen. Um, it's something that's very popular and talked about in Hollywood. I, there's not a um, conference or discussion I go to where the second screen isn't really kind of a, a point of conversation and focus. And that's our, our cell phones, your PDAs, your tablets, um, and your laptops, and how we're interacting with content creators. Um, and having conversations at them, with them, and over them. And I kind of thought about it and how I could relate this to back to government and the use of it. And one of the things I really found interesting was the use of the second screen in the recent presidential election. And I thought there were some really major themes, which um, uh, it's a nice seed from the, the NASA presentation because they touched upon the major themes that I saw coming out of the presidential election. And the presidential election gave us this great economy of scale to learn some lessons. You had a lot of people interacting. You had this kind of long timeline. So I kind of looked over the presidential election and thought, what are the kind of the, the themes or topics that I really kind of saw emerging? Um, now, mind you, I'm, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I'm not a political, uh, political pundit. I'm just an armchair enthusiast. Um, I'm, I'm a total nerd bomb when it comes to politics. So you can take me out of DC, but you you know can't take DC out of me. And um, I I scheduled my entire schedule around the presidential debates, the Republican National Committee, the Democratic National Committee. I wouldn't go to events. They have tons of like watch you know viewer party watching in uh, LA. And I wanted to be at home because I wanted to have like my laptop up. I wanted to have multiple channels going. I wanted to see everything happening online. And I thought that's that was a really compelling part of the presidential election that didn't get as much um, notice as, say, big data did, open data. Um, but it was a, a big factor in Obama winning this campaign. And I think it, it was one of the reasons he won, uh, was because he won the second screen. So without further ado, um, one of the things that I, this is kind of a, a big inflection point for the Obama campaign, and this was the 47% comment made by um, Romney uh, at a $50,000 ahead um, campaign fundraiser dinner. Um, it was kind of taken with this clandestine, you know, operation. Um, and uh, this is where he said, if you were, you know, kind of under a rock during this time, Mother Jones leaked it, you know, September 17th. Um, and he said basically that 47% of Americans, you know, are entitled, they don't pay taxes, and he doesn't care about them. I'm kind of uh, paraphrasing a little bit, but, um, and this was a huge inflection point because up until then, if you looked at kind of what was happening over the summer, um, Romney was gaining grounds as of June and July. He had outperformed Obama in terms of fundraising. In August, the polling numbers were neck and neck. He was actually pulling about 45. Obama was pulling about 45.5%. So he had kind of tightened the gap. September, he broke loose after the RNC and DNC, and I'll talk about that. But 47% in Romney Encore became this really major point of conversation. And um, I talk about resonance as relevant. It really resonated with people and kind of got people talking about a, a point in the campaign that Obama had tried to make an issue prior. Um, I don't know if you remember What Else Don't We Know? That was a kind of ad that uh, Obama was running, and it didn't really stick. You know, it didn't get people kind of talking. We were like, okay, yeah, Romney hasn't released his taxes prior to 2010, but it didn't gain traction in the media, really. So fast forward to September 17th when Mother Jones releases a video, and um, Nicholas Kristof, who is, you know, this famous author, works for the New York Times, he starts, this is his first foray into creating a meme, and this is the second point, the sub, you know, sub line is memes matter. Nicholas Kristoff starts the Romney Encore hashtag, and it takes off. It's a top trending item in Twitter, 47% is a top trending item in Twitter, and it becomes a point of conversation for the Obama campaign and a real turning point in terms of he, uh, the Ob Obama delineating himself from Romney. I, it kind of painted, oh, you know, Romney as this out of touch millionaire, which they hadn't really been able to paint that picture quite clearly. And by people talking about this, it became a talking point in the, in the conversation. Now, Obama during the first presidential debate, I'm, I'm sure everybody remembers that, at least I do, you know, they said Romney won, Obama came out, he seemed lacklustered, um, he didn't seem enthusiastic, he wasn't the great orator that people expected from him. 
and he didn't bring up 47%. Fast forward to a week later to the vice presidential debate when Biden drops the 47% bomb, 47% back into like the public discussion, everybody's talking about it, and it really became you know, a, a point of conversation, and people said, this matters to us. And it goes back to something that, um, I don't know if you guys are West Wing fans, I am, um, and I've been having little West Wing reunions, or uh, marathon, because it's on, all six seasons are on um, Netflix right now, and they're o the Bartlett campaign was always uh, polling, right? He was, they're always going to Joey Lawrence. They're like, we went polling data on this. Memes are the new polling data. This is what people care about. This is what they want addressed. And 47% became the new polling data. This matters in the campaign. And it did. The middle class mattered. And that was saying Romney was out of touch with the middle class. Um, on a tangential note, uh, uh, we've seen from the Boston Marathon bombings, we are we are now in an always-on society. We are constantly being recorded, um, and not from the top, the eye in the sky, which is uh, surveillance, but from our personal our devices. And surveillance, I if it's kind of a common phrase in um, the intelligence community, but it's the, it's, you know, surveillance is from the French word sur, from above, veille, to watch, and then when you substitute su is from below. But it's that um, constant recording of activity from personal devices. We are always on, and that was the second lesson, which um, I'm sure Romney have le has learned now. But um, and that goes to government officials, to any type of agency member. You know what you say is going to be recorded, and uh, just from good housekeeping, you know, be impeccable with your word. Um, second point: uh, friends really do matter, and it did matter in this campaign. And um, you know, there's a lot of things that Obama's campaign did right. This is one of them. They used uh, Facebook really to replicate the door-to-door -door knocking kind of um, field organizers on a gra uh, mass scale. During the final weeks of the campaign, um, Obama supporters received pictures of friends in swing states. They were then urged to click a button asking the swing state voters to register to vote, to vote early, um, and to get to the polls. Um, and the cam campaign found that this tactic worked 20% of the time, in large part because the message came from someone they knew. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Edelman Group, but they're kind of this big PR agency, and every year they do a trust barometer. Um, and over the years, they've shown that if they kind of poll like 5,000 individuals over the world, and they kind of gauge what, what people's trust are in major organizations and bodies. And over the years, public trust in institutions has been decreasing. Uh, we trust government agencies less, we trust um, corporate uh, industry less, we trust religious organizations less. We d w except for in business, uh, technology is graded at like about 77%, so they have a fairly high level of trust if you're a technology business. But overall, trust has um, decreased in, in kind of government agencies. But this is where government can actually, you know, harness the power of the friends network. If the message is coming from a friend, you can actually reach those those voters, those constituents, those people that matter that you're trying to communicate through their friends network. And that's what they're having. You're going to have to do that in order to combat this kind of growing dis discomfort or um, deterioration of trust. Uh, lesson number three. This is something NASA has done really, really well. And I actually was going to bring up the Gale Crater, I am in you. Humor is an extremely powerful uh, mode of communication, of motivating, and resonance. And um, if you haven't heard of the Binders Full of Women meme, um, <laughs> it, it dominated, if you were watching uh, media, it dominated the media. It was a pr preeminent talking point. Now, some people didn't really get it. They're like, why does that matter? Well, during the second presidential debate, Romney was asked, it was the... Um, kind of domestic town hall, he was asked, you know, do you support um, equal pay for women? He doesn't answer the question. He then goes into how during his um, uh, administration as governor of Massachusetts that he wanted to, you know, fill his cabinet um, with women and that he had people bring them binders full of qualified women. Well, this meme t took off and it really resonated with people because before then, the issue of women hadn't really kind of been a noticeable or notable talking point in the campaign. But this made it a talking point in the campaign, and it delineated Romney from Obama. And I'm going to, um, I'm not calling Romney a misogynist, but Sheryl Sandberg calls it the nice guy misogynist. And it kind of helped paint that picture and really kind of um, crystallize this, these two different types of. Um, 
you know, candidates, which is interesting because uh, we went to, my boyfriend and I went to a uh, talk, and prior to really the debates, Romney and Obama were fairly similar leaders. They, they were both uh, extreme pragmatists. They're pr fairly moderate, well-educated, well-spoken. They both went to Harvard. So there, there wasn't this huge disparity. I mean, yes, he was a millionaire and a businessman, but in terms of their leadership styles, they're fairly similar. So Obama really had to make a delineation for how is he, he different. And the binder School of Women was hilarious, but it dominated the media and helped delineate this factor. Um, just so you have the precursor, the predecessor to this, text from Hillary was a, a year before. <laughs> it, w it resonated with people. They're huge Hillary fans. Um, if you haven't seen it, go back and read it because they're just hilarious. But another great use of how to get to kind of instill the conversation, um, someone had taken a picture of Hillary on uh, her military airplane, wearing the sunglasses, texting on her Blackberry, and they started this Tumblr site, which you know is just a micro news blogging site or photo blogging site, um, and kind of created these little taglines or you know commentary. And, and Hillary actually responded. The, the creators of it um, actually got to meet her, and she submitted her own, which was this one. And it showed her command of, she understood the power of this medium, the power of the second screen. Um, before I get to the next slide, and, and one of the reasons this is so important, talk about memes, talk about humor, is that for the second screen, as the screen size um, diminishes or shrinks, our attention spans grow smaller. So if you think of it in terms of movies, right? We go to the movie theater, our attention span's about two to three hours. The smaller the screen gets, television, one to two. Laptops, about like 15 minutes for content. Your cell phone is about two to three minutes. And th they've shown that, that our attention span kind of decreases as the screen size decreases. But everybody's on their mobile now. Not as many people are watching television news. You know, the way we get our information, the way we get our content is going to a smaller devices. So you have to be able to command these smaller screens in order to captivate, um, which will get me to the third lesson. But um, I did want to make the point um, that the, the the message from this, I got actually kind of stole this from Kathy Sierra, um, is never underestimate the power of fun. Um, Kathy Sierra is kind of this luminary in the technology world. In 2006, she um, used a comment or a, uh, an example of how this uh, water municipality in Bryan, Texas, um, every year they're legally bound to release a drinking um, water quality report, and you know the contents kind of stayed. Government's not the sexiest, you know, most invigorating, you know, kind of institution, but they have to release this port. And they said, how can we do this in an innovative, fun way? So they decided to release a calendar, which is 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 fine, except they're they're going to feature actually um, employees of the munis the waterworks municipality, and these are just your average, you know, guys and gals. And but they really had fun with it. So it's not the you know the sexy Victoria's Secret or Sports Illustrated swimsuit mall. But this took off. People loved it. They were hanging in their homes at work, and they actually uh, read the port, read re the report, and it increased user engagement. So a really powerful way to increase user engagement to get people, um, you know, talking and interested and paying attention is the use of humor. Now, uh, if anybody was watching uh, the Republican National Convention, you might, uh, you know, bring up the next topic or the next point, which is. Clint Eastwood, which was, um, if I can get out of here, I'm just going to show a clip of it real quick, and let's see if I, <laughs> let's see. I don't think I'm going to have volume, so it's just going to be from, let's see. Is it working? Ooh. Oh, well. All right. Well, um, it should be playing, but I don't know why it's not. The point being, um, during the Republican National Convention, uh, if you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. Um, Clint Eastwood dis the, did this, you know, improvisational um, uh, reenactment or enactment of him having a conversation with President Obama using a chair. Um, the the kind of re response to it was mixed. Some people loved it; they thought it was, you know, kind of a nice departure, it kind of showed, you know, risk, and, but for a lot of people it fell flat. It, it seemed kind of disrespectful to our sitting president. Um, he basically said Obama was telling Romney to go fuck himself, uh, in not so many words. Um, he didn't say that, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> sorry. 
Um, yeah. Um, but it became the number one. It, it kind of precluded everything from the RNC. Eastwooding was the top trending, you know, tag and, and conversation around the RNC. You're not supposed to, you know, like what, I don't even remember what Romney said because everybody was talking about Eastwood and kind of what happened. So, but within an hour or two of this happening, I don't know if everybody remembers this, but Obama comes out with this seat's taken. It was a genius use of the second screen. It, it kind of eclipsed the RNC. Um, this seat taken was uh, kind of re retweeted and um, favorited over 100,000 times. And it was really kind of a genius and smart, fun way to respond to something that was kind of um, not very positive. It was kind of kind of a, a dark or you know a not positive moment in the campaign. So. Uh, I thought it was an excellent use, use of the second screen. And going back to what I said about the screen, you know, the, the, the medium being smaller in our attention span, you know, it's three words, it's one picture, uh, but a picture paints a thousand words, and it became like a true talking point um, during this campaign. Um, and that gets back to snackability. Uh, my friend Leslie Bradshaw, she's the COO of um, a, a new startup called Guide. She was previously the COO and co-founder of a data visualization company in LA. And she, she's really focused on data visualization and content creation. And she introduced this topic to me, or at least this is where I first heard of it, about content needing to be snackable, which is it needs to be brief but powerful. And either that's through video, that's through um, photographs and messaging. We, we're competing for attention spans. We're, there's a lot of noise and we've got to find the signals and you have to be powerful and concise. And so content needs to be snackability, uh, snackable in kind of the current landscape of social media. Um, and, and just to make a point, for, for this photo, four more years, again, uh, President Obama, after he won the, um, the presidency, he uh, the it, the team tweeted this out, and it became the number one uh, tweeted moment in Twitter's history. So that's just the power of that. Now, what's interesting also is that um, Romney's campaign really wasn't doing a lot of this. Obama really commanded and got the use of the second screen um, in, this, uh, in this campaign. And that brings me to the, the fifth point, which is the medium is the office, uh, the audience which is there is no panacea for social media. You cannot go to one place. You cannot go to Twitter. You cannot go to Facebook, Facebook in order to get your audience. Uh, audience are, you know, if you're younger, you're not even on Facebook. That's an old person's medium. You're on Snapchat. You're on text. You, so you have to go where your audience is. And Obama uh, made history again when he did a Reddit. And this is going back to NASA. The number one Reddit moment um, during this Ask Me Anything, where you get about an hour, he takes questions. He was the first sitting president ever to do a Reddit. They had other notables like um, Bill Gates. Um, but the reason why this was so important is because Reddit represented a specific audience. They were young males, either in their teens or 20s, um, kind of uh, educated, nerdy. They're th you know, it's a news aggregator, so they tend to share kind of, you know, gaming or like kind of humoric, uh, hum humorous kind of. Um, I don't know, topics, and he engaged with a targeted audience. They were, he was trying to win the young, the youth vote, and he was trying to, you know, really engage with males, and I think he did a really good job. Like, it was a risk, you know, kind of a risk-taking move. It was a bold move, but it was well done. Incidentally, uh, Reddit also asked Romney to participate in the AMA, and he declined, or they never got back to him. So, um, I just want to give you kind of an overall snapshot of um, kind of the digital campaign spending. Um, Obama spent $47 million, which in the grand scheme of the $2 billion spent during this campaign um, isn't that, you know, notable. But in, in comparison to Romney, uh, it was tenfold. Romney spent $4.7 Obama did a really good job going to where his audience was. He did he did Google Hangouts. He did uh, Facebook um, Facebook town halls. He went to Reddit. The, he was he was on all the different mediums, having the conversations that they, they needed to have in order to kind of win support. Um, and I also use this to frame it. A lot of these tools don't cost a lot. Government agencies don't need to spend a lot in order to kind of engage their customers. Um, Someone asked NASA why they were doing it. Yeah, um, I, education is e extremely important and inf information, but also, you know, 
citizens are to you know are the shareholders we are taxpayers and we are shareholders to of of government agencies so these are people that you are winning your support of if if w if we don't know what's going on with nasa we're not going to vote for people who care about nasa we're not going to you know make that a priority in our kind of public agenda so um that's basically it what i have if anybody has any questions i'm certainly open and I've never given this talk, so <laughs> thanks for coming on the ride with me.